have to have all the answers all the time. <laughs> that, that's like almost cussing at somebody. You don't have to have all the answers all the time. Some of us struggle with not having the details and we're disgusted with ambiguity. Some of us, like, like me, I'll give you an example, me. Um, I love having details. I'm a detail-oriented type of person. But there are some days where I have to tell God, I trust you more than I trust the details. And if that means for these moments, I have to live in a state of ambiguity, as long as you are in control, I'm okay with that. thing you know how we think that in order to be more of him we have to be less of us okay I have a new take on that I really do I believe God gave me a new take on that because in order to be more of him you have to be more of the real you it's not less of me it's not less of me it's more of the me that he had in mind before he formed me in my mother's womb. It's that girl I'm becoming. I'm not becoming less of Pam. I'm becoming more of the original thought of God. That's who she really is. I'm excited to bring on my sister, uh, Sister Jessica Robinson. Ooh. What's going on, sis? Hello. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Man, we're so excited about the chance for you to be able to be a part of what God is doing with us. And I'm excited to be able to share you with the world. I've been kind of stingy with you for a while now. <laughs> um, but for those of you that do not know, Jessica, you're going to learn very, very quickly that Jessica is a gift to the body of Christ. Those of you that um, know her very well, you are familiar um, with the quality that she provides to anybody's life um, that she enters into. And um, I'm excited to share you with Christ Church and those that are the, those that are watching uh, tonight. Several years ago, I, I want to kind of start with <laughs> the introduction how, how stuff started. Sure. Se several years ago, I had the opportunity. I think it may have been at CAMU first. Um, several years ago, I had I the chance so, yeah. to uh, meet Jessica or cross paths with Jessica um, during Cam U, um, which is the Canadian Apostolic, Apostolic Ministries. Ministries and the U stands for it. No, what was the U again? The U is for youth. So Cam okay. U, yeah. <laughs> all right, we're just going to say universal. You know, all that kind of <laughs> but I, I had the opportunity to minister there. Um, it, it was just, it was a beautiful opportunity. And since then, um, I've always loved going uh, going to minister at any of, any of those ministries um, there um, in Canada, in the Toronto, in the Mississauga. I mean, just everywhere. Mm -hmm. Just so excited about being there every time I go. When I go, when I come home, I tell my wife, you know, I think the Lord is calling us <laughs> to move on to Canada. There's just a, there's just a unique spirit, uh, just such a unique spirit and a very high spirit of worship and praise there mm -hmm. um, that we absolutely love. But I crossed paths um, with Jess several years ago, um, really specifically during a ministry opportunity that I had um, there in tri uh, Triumphant. And the spirit of God was moving very, very strongly there mm -hmm. um, during that worship experience. And I saw the hand of God on Jessica, um, not only to be able to do something in that area, 
um, it, locally, but I saw God doing something for her uh, globally mm -hmm. and not just for one gender. I think at the time mm -hmm. uh, she was really very heavily involved in women's empowerment. I mean, it was just it was just beautiful. But God, I really felt that the Lord was doing something strongly for her across gender lines. Mm -hmm. And I shared the word of the Lord with her. And since then, we've seen God do just unfold mm -hmm. some of it. You know what? What I'm going to do, Jess, I'm going to let you share. <laughs> I'm going to let you share your story. Then we're going to get into this conversation. But just kind of let the people know who you are, how mm -hmm. we were able to cross paths. And mm -hmm. um, we'll dive into this healing conversation. Yeah, for sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Sure. I really appreciate it. Um, so to, to continue, uh, so just so you guys know, I call Pastor James Tyson. I call him Tyson. <laughs> I've been calling him that since we met. So, yeah. you know, and he's cool with it. So I'm yeah. going to continue to call him that. All good. So, <laughs> so Tyson, I met Tyson, as you said, seven, several years ago. And predating even the uh, the prophetic word that shook me um, was my, I think was my very first speaking engagement outside of my church. And Tyson was preaching at Camu. And I remember I was so nervous. I was like, I was shaking. And I remember him saying, it's going to be okay. You're going to be fine. And he was just coaching me. And that was just a big moment for me. Um, and then now fast forward to that moment at my church, um, that shifted so many things for me. Um, I don't know if you remember, but you did the foreword for one of my books, This yeah. Generation. I was trying to find it, but it's, <laughs> it's in one of these books here. Um, yeah, and that was it. So ever so, since then, it's just been just perpetual growth and so forth. And God has just been doing amazing things. Um, so as Tyson said, I'm a Christian therapist right here in Toronto, Ontario. Um, I've been doing community work since I was about 18. I'm 31 now. Um, so I've been doing this work of trying to merge church and community for quite some time and i want to say within the last two years i've really found my groove um and then this year the lord called me to full-time ministry because i call it full-time ministry yeah. um and that is me doing um therapy full-time and i specifically work a lot of so i don't just work with christian folk yeah. but 99 percent of my <laughs> clients are okay. christians okay. um and i do retreats and i have a podcast so a bunch of stuff but my main focus is around emotionally healthy spirituality yeah. and emotional wholeness for people of faith particularly for those in the black community wow i think that's so good and so so needed particularly for um where we are now mm -hmm. i've been sharing with um i've been sharing with our congregation and i've been sharing with um those that i have the opportunity to minister to or talk to or whatever we're going to deal with this more during back at one too and that is you cannot come out of a year like 2020 and not address the level of trauma mm -hmm. that was connected to that year. And not only that, but it is still kind of trickled over. Absolutely. Into There's definitely like PTSD. You just, <laughs> yeah. You, you cannot mm -hmm. not address mm -hmm. what happened in that year and mm -hmm. think that everything is going to be just honky dory just gonna mm -hmm. be great and, and, mm -hmm. and you can move on mm -hmm. um we have to be able to develop healthy people healthy christians um and healthy individuals that will properly represent the kingdom of god absolutely that, that's where we've been in our conversation um for the past two weeks for those of you that are just now watching us or just coming in lean on that share button again um there's gonna be a really great conversation you're gonna really love this for the past two weeks, we have been engaged in a conversation, a really formative conversation um, that we have titled in this series, Heal. One of the things that we have been addressing is that it is impossible. When, wh wherever there are people, there will be pain. Mm -hmm. Wherever mm -hmm. there are people, that all right, I need somebody to put it in the comment section. Mm -hmm. Wherever there are people, there will be pain. Mm -hmm. a and pain, uniquely, is a equal opportunity employer you know I, I say this jokingly but with pain pain don't let you fill out no application 
it, don't, it don't give you no phone calls. Mm -mm. Um, I really, you know, he really give you no compensation. P pain just calls you one day. You mm -hmm. hire. It's your day. <laughs> and, and, and there you are. Mm -hmm. So everybody in some way, shape or form is going to experience some level of pain. Mm -hmm. But it is the passion of God. And it was the ministry of Jesus Christ that people experience the healing of God. Mm -hmm. uh, th mm -hmm. that, that is one of the most strongest revelations that people have to get. Mm -hmm. It is the desire of God for his people to be healed. Yes. But for yes. those of you that are watching, I need you to put that in the comments, guys. It mm -hmm. is the desire of God mm -hmm. for his people to be healed. Mm -hmm. You do not have to walk around sick. You don't have to live in anxiety. You don't have to live in stress. I mean, you, you don't have to. It is the passion of God uh, to heal his people. So mm -hmm. just tell me, mm -hmm. why do you think? Well, let me start with this. Mm -hmm. How do you mm -hmm. define healing? Let's, let's start there. Mm -hmm. For sure. So this was an interesting question um, because healing looks so different yeah. for so many different people. But to surmise it, I, I define healing as the alignment of mind, body, and soul. Wow. Right. So when there's an alignment, because and then some scriptures that we can use to justify that is, as you said, is it's it's God's heart that we are well. And if anybody knows me, my big saying, I've always said that it is the will of the father that we are well. Right. Yeah. So third John, believe it's third John one and two, it talks, it says, um, it says, beloved above all, I wish that your soul would prosper. Right. As you are in good health. I wish that your soul would prosper. So there's that alignment as well. Yeah. Um, I also think about Paul. Um, I believe it was in Romans 7 when it talks about the fact that he talks about this warring in his members, right? Because a lot of people, a lot of time, they look so well put together on the yeah. outside. Yeah. There's some, they look great. You would never think that something is happening with them, but on the inside, they're broken, right? There's, there's trauma has literally become a part of their identity, right? Um, and so as, as Paul said, he said, rescue me from this, from this, from this thing, from this yeah. body. It stinks. Yeah. Literally like, yeah. please, yeah. I, I want to rid myself of it. Um, and then another aspect of that too is Proverbs 4 and 23, a very familiar scripture, which says, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it flows the issues of life, right? And so this is why it's important now as we talk about mental health um, and defining healing that we become aware of our emotions yeah. right we're aware of what's coming in and we're aware of what's going out so yeah. and in order for that to happen there has to be now that alignment with mind body and soul so that's yeah. how I've I've been able to define healing that's good it, mm -hmm. so you, you said something very very unique mm -hmm. um, in your conversation or in your explanation that people mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> they trauma has become a part of their identity. Mm -hmm. What's amazing is a lot of people may not know they don't that yeah. trauma is a part of their identity. So they how don't. how are you able to identify mm -hmm. um us outside of maybe going to a Christian therapist or, or mm -hmm. just to a counselor in general? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How am I able to identify? Hey, I am living in the trauma of my past mm -hmm. and it has become mm -hmm. an identity for me. Mm -hmm. how, how do you do that? I think one of the ways that we can do that is, so we've heard the term when, okay, say you and I are talking yeah. and I did something, right? And you say to me, Jess, you know, you try to call me out or cover me or whatever. And I'm kind of like, well, that's just the way that I am. Yeah. Right. That is a huge indicator that trauma is a part of your identity. Wow. When you are just like this, when you, there's no self-awareness, there's no wanting to um, develop, there's no personal development, that type of stuff. Wow. It becomes ingrained in, in who you are and how you respond and how you navigate through life. So this aspect of like, this is just the way that I am, that is a huge indicator that trauma has become a part of your identity. Good grief. And I, I hear that a lot mm -hmm. from a lot mm -hmm. of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people know that that is a, 
like that's a cue. Yeah. That, that you, you're living in trauma. And what's yeah. unique is I hear a lot of it in church. Mm-hmm. Why, why do you think, <laughs> I think we're getting ready to go down a rabbit hole tonight, <laughs> that we may get in trouble <laughs> if, if Bishop Nunes gives me a call. <laughs> no. So, so we, we hear a lot about that in church, but I don't mm-hmm. think we talk enough about why it's important for us to have this conversation mm-hmm. around healing. You know, mm-hmm. now a lot of churches are doing better with this, mm-hmm. and I think that's great. They should, mm-hmm. but in, in your opinion, why mm-hmm. is it so important that we are um, having this conversation around healing? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. why is it important that the church mm-hmm. has this conversation around healing? Mm-hmm. I think first is realizing that it is the will of the Father that we are well. Yeah. Like yeah. he wants us to be well. Like Jesus never came in in contact with anyone that wasn't well and they left the same. Yeah. He healed every single one of them. Yeah. Every single one of them, right? So that's 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 the first aspect. The second is that, especially particularly to the black church, like mm. we've all encountered some level of trauma. Yeah. Right? Whether it's racial trauma, whether it's intergenerational trauma, whether it's childhood trauma, there's some type of trauma that we've experienced. Yeah. Um, Dr. Anita Phillips, who is my goals, um, I want to be like her when I grow up. She defines trauma as anything that shifts the way that we see ourselves, God, and others. Wow. If you have had an encounter or a situation or event in your life that has shifted the way you see yourself, the way you see God, and the way you see others, there's some type of inner healing that needs to take place. Wow. Right? There's some type of work that needs to take place. And why is it important for us as a church? This, I borrowed this from my friend, but it's such a powerful narrative. The church is like a hospital, right? It is a hospital for the sick. We see, again, we see Christ exemplifying this as he was in the earth. But right now, the church is, the hospital beds are filled with saints. Wow. And we need to get out of the beds so that we can have people come in and be saved. Wow. Right? If we are consistently in the hospital beds, if we're not making room for the people in the world or for unsaved people, then what are we doing? Right? I have this saying that I say, you know how they always say hurt people hurt people? Yeah. I say heal people, heal people. Yeah. Right? When we have gone through our own healing encounters, we become like the woman of Samaria, where she says, come see a man. Yeah. He will tell you about your life. Right? So I think that's why it is important for us, because when we haven't gone through our own healing processes and our own healing journeys, it is hard. And that's why, as we will go into this about the spirit of offense and all this type of stuff, that's why these things consistently come up, because we're not taking the time to reflect and to heal. Wow. I, I hope that you guys are really getting this, because a lot, <laughs> a, a lot of us may be in most hospital beds that Jess is talking about, guys. Mm-hmm. One of one of the one of the concerns that, that I'm that I'm seeing in our in our ministries is that we are doing an exceptional job mm. with using our spirituality mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to cover mm-hmm. our um, our trauma, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Our, our our pain our offenses we're going to talk about that in a minute like you said Mm -hmm. but i are do do you think we're we're, do you think we're being too churchy like and and not really dealing with things Mm -hmm. head on Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and if so how how have you been able to in your conversations Mm -hmm. um not just in church, but in, in, in outside conversations as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How have you been able to kind of m- remove the mask from mm-hmm. people's faces mm-hmm. so that we can be honest mm-hmm. and stop lying behind tongues <laughs> and shout. <laughs> and, and I mean, we huck and buck, but then, but then you, but then you go out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we see on Facebook, mm-hmm. you're not okay. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> how are you? Mm-hmm. How are you dealing with that? Because mm-hmm. what I believe you're doing, it, like you said, is a ministry. Mm-hmm. So how are you dealing with that thing head on, mm-hmm. so that we can all be well? Mm-hmm. As you said, so to answer the question, yes, I do think we are over spiritualizing things, yeah. and a lot of the times we. So in addition to our shouting and speaking in tongues, rakanda bohosha. We also need, and then we go to the altar yeah. and convention after convention or conference after conference, we get laid hands on, hands laid on, and, you know, we fall out or whatever, but then we go back to the same thing. And I think it's also a lack of proper teaching that wow. we've been over-spiritualizing a soul issue. Yeah. Right? So... Yes, the spirit is fine, but there's also the aspect of over-spiritualizing a soul issue. There is something that is going on deep down in your soul from childhood. There's a seed that is planted there that needs to, needs to be uprooted and it needs to be attended to. So it's kind of like, okay, why am I going to, the, going to the altar and nothing is changing? Because we are spiritualizing a soul issue, right? And needing to realize that man is tripartite, right? We are spirit, mind, body, like understanding that all of, and that's why I said healing is these things coming into alignment, right? And realizing that we need to attend to each of these different things. Yeah. So how have I had these conversations? Proper teaching, yeah. right? Proper teaching of the word. Um, one of the ways that I've done this personally is through my podcast, right? So she speaks truth, breaking down the word, right? And I'm a big proponent of emotionally healthy spirituality. And I don't know if you've ever read the book. This is by Pete Scazzaro. So he has emotionally healthy spiritual. You will love this book, Tyson. And there's emotionally healthy leadership, such a good book. And one of the things he talks about is that you cannot be spiritually mature and emotionally immature. Good grief. Wow. Right. So for a lot of us, we are spiritually mature, but we are emotionally we're like two. Because we don't know how to navigate through our emotions. If somebody steps on our, we're ready to hype yeah. up and all. And I understand, quote unquote, the reaction, yeah. I guess. But it's not being able to reflect on that. Yeah. We don't practice contemplation. We don't practice the spiritual formations. Right. We've really just been able to just churchify this thing. Yeah. And we need to like, you know, I don't know if they did this um, in your churches when we were growing up. But we're growing up. There'd be times when my pastor, not a triumphant, but my church in Antigua, my pastor, he would just shut down the choir, everything. He said, we all need to repent and go on fasting. Wow. Right. I mean, it's yeah. a little, you know, but, you know, <laughs> you know, no but, judgment. No judgment, right? Yeah. But it's like there really needs to be this aspect of like focusing on um, our soul. Yeah. Our soul needs some attending to. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That That's something that we're, we're doing in our ministry right now. Mm-hmm. Um, several of our leaders right now, we're, we're, we've instituted something in our ministry called Summer Break, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. an opportunity for those in our um, key leadership roles, mm-hmm. putting to take about two to four weeks mm-hmm. to rest, mm-hmm. to regroup, mm-hmm. to refresh their minds. Because the dangerous thing that I'm finding is it's becoming more and more common for people to continue to pour mm-hmm. from an empty cup. Yes. And they call it like grinding. And yes. Like yes. I don't, you know, up all night on my grind. No, that's stupid. It is. Like, Go to bed. I think, like I don't <laughs> I don't think people understand. Like that's mm-hmm. that's not cool. No. Like that is not no. cool. No. And, and we have to find a way, like you mm-hmm. said, for us to be able to heal our our souls. Mm-hmm. I, I'm noticing a common thread between what you're saying. Are are you are you noticing a commonalities mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in dysfunction <laughs> in, 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 in the in the kingdom of God at large like what mm-hmm. what commonality what di- what dysfunction mm-hmm. is just getting under your skin right oh now oh my god there's so many that, <laughs> <laughs> that it, it, it's just mm-hmm. I, cause I got my few mm-hmm. but what, what what's getting under your skin right now 
that mm-hmm. people that don't realize, hey guys, if we keep going down this road, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's not gonna end well for us. Like mm-hmm. what what some of the stuff that you've seen that's kind of mm-hmm. I, I know it's a lot, but yes. just give me like one <laughs> or two of them. I think one of the big ones is is you know what you've made reference to around this hustle culture yeah. that has crept crept into the church. Um, this aspect of like I have to, particularly around ministry leaders, yeah. especially well I shouldn't say especially young. I think we inherited it to be honest from the generation before us. Okay. This hustle. Of I have to do this. I must do this. Th- like it's it's a grind that leads to burnout. Wow. Right. And as you said, there's when people pour from an empty cup, they become resentful. Mm. And then the burnout comes. Hold on, back up, because we're gonna break that down. <laughs> you, you said you pour from an empty cup, they become resentful. Yes. Then the they burnout do. comes. Yes. Talk about that resentment, and then we'll, we'll dive into that burnout. Absolutely. And I'll speak from my own personal experience, right? It's this aspect of, like, I have to do this. I yeah. must do this. But then what happens is, so so here is how we're going to make the connection of how ministry has been validating dysfunction, Good. right? Oh, boy. When people... Feel Fine. like okay, I need to do this, or this has to happen. There's this aspect of like validating some. So, for example, let's use myself. When I grew up without my dad, right, um, and in my life, and so there is a lot of childhood traumas I have experienced as it pertains to just my dad not being around. So, me being in ministry was validating. Hmm. I liked the validation. I liked be- hearing you did well. I, all these different types of things. And as young ministers, I feel like sometimes our forefathers, they don't tell us or give us a chance to heal, to go through those healing journeys and healing processes before they prop us up. Hmm. Right? So it's important now that we are healing because what ends up happening is ministry stuff ends up validating that. Yeah that trauma that you have experienced or that needed that need to be validated that need to be affirmed where it now comes from man as opposed to coming from god yeah. right in addition to that there's now um this aspect of 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 where people the resentment and the burnout where people are doing 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 they may not necessarily get that validation yeah. or maybe they do but it's like, I'm doing for the ministry. I'm doing for this. I'm doing for that. And then they become resentful because they're pouring from an empty cup. It's like when the rubber meets the road, literally. Yeah. Right? It it burns. Yeah. Right? So you, you, you're not pouring from a place of overflow. Yeah. You're not living from a place of overflow. And so you become resentful yeah. because if you're on E... Then what are you, what what's coming out? And then when you're on E, you really begin to see the contents of your heart, Absolutely. right? Proverbs four twenty three. Keep your heart with all diligence. Yeah. No one to say no. Yeah. No one to set those boundaries and know the difference between a boundary and a wall. That's a whole different conversation. Um, for out of it flows the issues of life. If you're realizing that you're becoming super resentful and different things like that. There's something deeper that is happening. Yeah, so good. And and what I what I'm noticing at the same time is because we're gonna come back to that wall in just a second. <laughs> well, this is not a conversation. We're just gonna. Leave there. <laughs> um, what I'm noticing is as a result of people's resentment, or if their expectation mm-hmm. of being validated mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. does not, it, somebody doesn't follow through with that. Then we start moving into offense. Yes, absolutely. So let's ha- let's have some conversation around that. <laughs> Sunday, guys, if, if you were not with us on Sunday or you did not watch the service on Sunday, I sh- okay, I need somebody to put it in the comments, like a link or something. Go to YouTube, go to Facebook or whatever, and go back and watch the message from Sunday. Um, that was called It's Not Safe 
here. Mm. We kind of unpacked some things. I, I couldn't even dive into all of it mm -hmm. because we would we literally would have been there all day. Mm -hmm. uh, but we talked, we spoke from the topic um, or, or, or from the passage in Proverbs 18 and 19. Proverbs 18 and 19, guys. I want to read that to you real, real quick. Mm -hmm. I could only get to the comma. I couldn't even, <laughs> I, I couldn't even de deal with the rest of it. I'm going to have to deal with that in a whole other teaching. The Bible says a brother offended mm. is more unyielding than a strong city. Mm -hmm. I mean, so just <laughs> last week, mm -hmm. I did my fifth run through um, of reading the Bible in this entire. Mm -hmm. I was very, very, I said this in Saints on Sunday. I was very, very proud of myself. Of course. You know, I was like, man, I, yes, I did it. Let's go mm -hmm. to another version of the Bible. Let's read it. But when I got to this passage, I was a bit, I was offended. <laughs> like, like I, I've read through the Bible this many times and mm -hmm. read through Proverbs more, more times, but I never saw this passage mm -hmm. in a way that I saw it mm -hmm. uh, in the presentation that mm -hmm. I did for for Sunday. Mm -hmm. A lot of people may, for, so for those of you that are not, not, we're not watching on Sunday when Solomon talks about um, a brother offended. It's like an unyielding mm. uh, it is unyielding, like a strong city. That word strong city translates in the Hebrew over to a wall, a, a mm. wall city. Mm -hmm. Everybody, when you're building a wall in that, in that context, it is a form of defense. Mm and a place that you run to when you feel attacked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm. and uh, so when, you, when you're dealing with that wall, walls are not built all one at a time. No. In that context, they're mm -hmm. built one brick at a time. Mm -hmm. So when, when, when Solomon is talking about a brother offended is un, as unyielding mm -hmm. as a strong city, it's offense on top of offense, a perspective, opinion on top of one another. Mm -hmm. And it creates this wall where I feel like I am safer behind this wall mm -hmm. um, than being out there with them mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. realizing mm -hmm. that my offense is what sponsored what I'm using to be defensive against other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So kind of talk to us about mm -hmm. um, that difference between mm -hmm. establishing boundaries mm -hmm. and like what Solomon is saying, mm -hmm. creating a wall mm -hmm. where you feel like you're safer mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. inside this mm -hmm. than coming from beyond the wall. So kind of, kind of talk to us about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. For sure. Boundaries are created. Walls are built. Okay. As you said, over time, boundaries are healthy. Walls are unhealthy. Yeah. Right. A boundary is something that can be shifted, can be moved, you know, depending on the context. Yeah. A wall, you got to chip away at that thing. Wow. You have to chip away. You have to go to the foundation or you have to use a bulldozer. Yeah. To 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 move it away. Right. Yeah. And that's the difference now between a boundary and a wall. And and people often don't realize that it's like I'm building a boundary. OK, this is my yeah. boundary. Don't cross my boundary, right? When yeah. really it's a wall. Yeah. It's a defense mechanism. Yeah. Right? Yeah. However, we have had to use defense mechanisms as coping mechanisms. Wow. Right? So def a defense mechanism is really, in truth, a coping mechanism, right? So when you were a little girl, when I was a little girl, and they would say that I was fat, I'd be like, it's okay. I don't care. You tell me I'm fat, whatever. That was my defense or my mech my coping. But as I got older and somebody else says it, wh who are you talking to? Yeah. Are you good? Yeah. Type of thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> are you good? Like, who are you talking to? Yeah. And then now it becomes, why are you so defensive? Yeah. Because as a little girl, when you spoke to me in that way, I yeah. started to, because you said it doesn't, de it, as you said, it doesn't develop just like right there. It starts developing 
in childhood and that's why for me as a christian therapist as just a therapist in general i always start with the family of origin and childhood yeah i always say tell me about your family of origin tell me about your relationship with your mom yeah tell me about the relationship with your dad do you have siblings tell me about your relationship there and generally you'll get an aha moment mm -hmm. because what ends up happening is those defense mechanisms were were planted those seeds were planted right then and there but it was what you used to cope yeah and so then now one of the questions that i ask my clients all the time and put this in the comment or write this down for yourself yeah. what is the vision that you have for this version of yourself wow right are we going to continue? We're not going to continue using the words, this is the way that I am. Yeah. Right? Because now we're on a journey of post-traumatic growth. Right? Life after trauma. Yeah. Right? What does that look like? Right? It looks like Christ has come that I may have life and have it more abundantly. Yeah. And because I have life more abundantly, I do not have to walk around with a wall. Yeah. I do not have to walk around like this. Because as you said, well, you said on Sunday, I'm not safe here. Yeah. But as we now journey through, we can say, I'm safe now. Yeah. Right? I'm yeah. safe now. I'm not the little girl or the little boy that was abused or spoken down to or abandoned or rejected. Yeah. And so it's us it's for us to really take time to practice mindfulness. Yeah. Right. Psalms 19 and 14 says, let the words of my mouth yeah. and the meditation of my heart mm -hmm. be acceptable. And one question I ask myself every day, Tyson, I ask myself, Jess, how is your heart today? Mm. How many times do we actually ask ourselves how we're doing? Yeah. Right. What, when do we take the time to reflect? And this connects back, as we said, to those dysfunctions of this hustle culture of I need to do this because it, it, it feeds our insecurities when we're validated. It feeds our dysfunction, yeah. right? The last thing I'll say is I remember when um, I had applied to go to uh, graduate school a second time to do my doctoral degree in Christian counseling. I was like, yeah, I got in, I was gonna go. And I remember the Lord saying, it's not time. And I was like, I'm like, I could be doctor right now. <laughs> and I remember him asking me, who would you be outside of all of your stuff? And I had to take time to reflect on that. Yeah. Right. And so it's important that we take time to reflect and take time to do some introspective work. Yeah. Because then now when we are aware of our emotions and how we respond to things, we're able to journey back a lot of the time to be like, ah, uh, I remember when that happened and maybe that's why I respond in this way. Yeah. Yeah. So, so tell me, what does, hmm, <laughs> what does the process mm -hmm. of becoming safe Look like. mm -hmm. Again, mm -hmm. we, we have a lot of people that that may be watching right now mm -hmm. that feel like, well, if if I was able to do this, that, or the third, that's mm -hmm. my means of feeling like I'm safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, or you know, if I return back to this environment, that's mm -hmm. what it means to me to be mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. safe. But that's not always safe places. You know, mm -hmm. one of the things I one of the things I love, and I I can't wait to hear your your comment on this. One of the things I love about Jesus is that we talk about in the context of the Garden of Gethsemane, mm -hmm. we talk mm -hmm. about um, the main thing that the Garden of Gethsemane is prominent for is for the betrayal of Jesus by Judas, mm -hmm. not realizing that Jesus would frequent the Garden of Gethsemane, mm. because Gethsemane was a safe place for Jesus mm. where he did not have to um, be divine. Mm. He, ca he could have been mm -hmm. human in mm -hmm. that moment. Mm -hmm. See, every, everywhere I can't sweat great drops of blood, mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. do that in my safe place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't develop relational opportunities like I did with the disciples mm -hmm. unless mm -hmm. I'm in a Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. 
So tell us what is our process or what can be our process Mm -hmm. to discover a safe place or or for me Mm -hmm. to be safe. People Mm -hmm. are dealing with years. You talked Mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. Years of trauma, years Mm -hmm. of issues. Mm -hmm. Like what's something that will help me to discover that safe place or become safe? I, I think one of the first things is acknowledging it. Okay. Right? Um, a lot of the times we don't acknowledge it. Right? And we don't talk about it. Yeah. And I think that's one of the first things is being able to acknowledge it yeah. and to talk about it. Right? Um, for some people, it's really in their subconscious is in a dark place. That's a whole other aspect. But for those who do remember, it's acknowledging it. Yeah. Right. And then finding somebody to journey with you through that. Right. Realizing you don't have to do this alone. Yeah. And this is where I believe that therapy is important. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of people see. So I see therapy as three things. I see it as intervention, prevention, and I see it as a form of discipleship as well. Wow. Right. So it's being able now to say, okay, I acknowledge that this thing happened to me. Right. And now being able to say, okay, I'm going to reach out for help because you don't have to do it by yourself. Not even Jesus. I mean, his disciples fell asleep, but at least they were there. (laughs) At least they were there, right? They were there. He said, could you not watch with me? But they were there for the most part. You don't have to do it alone. Yeah. Right. You can heal in community. Right. And it's being able also to to tap into resources like these conversations like these um, books, podcasts, different things, in addition to receiving support from a therapist. I think that's super, super important because a lot of the times what we try to do as well is try, we try to journey to that unsafe place by ourselves. Yeah. And that's not safe. Yeah. yeah, that's not safe because then now there are triggers. Yeah. Right. So a lot of times you go to therapy. If anybody has ever been to therapy, you go. I remember my first therapy session. It this is going to sound really weird, but it felt as though my insides were exposed. Mm. I felt like I was walking around inside out. Everybody knew what was going on inside of me. And that is that is an uncomfortable feeling, especially when you have buried something for so long. But I would say the first step is to acknowledge it and to know that you don't have to journey through this alone. Yeah. You really don't. And know that it is the will of the Father that you are well. The enemy comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But Christ, he came that we would have life and have it more abundantly. And a part of the abundant life is healing and healing from our past traumas. Yeah, yeah. You said somebody somebody needs to help you with this. Yes. Somebody needs to help walk you through yes. this. Yes. Now, there are some contexts, and what you're saying is so good, we may ruffle some feathers for like the last five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> some people may believe mm-hmm. that it is almost a suppression of your faith mm-hmm. to go to a counselor mm-hmm, mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. go to a therapist. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I want to hear your opinion. I, I know you're a therapist. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I know you're a therapist. <laughs> if, we sit, if we're sitting in the room together mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and somebody says, you know what? I just don't feel like, you know, I feel like I, I'm I'm losing my faith mm-hmm. if I just don't let the, just don't let the Lord, I'm just going to mm-hmm. let the Lord do it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What, what is your, what is your response to that? Absolutely. So, I think the first thing is normalizing mental health. Yeah. Just normalizing yeah. it, right? Realizing that mental health is just as important as our physical health, yeah. right? Everybody has mental health, right? Everybody has physical health. Everybody may not have good mental health. But everybody has mental health, yeah. right? Because a men- mental health is different from mental illness. Very different um, things, right? So the first thing is to normalize. I would ask the person, do you, you have a mind? Do you have emotions? Yes, of course, right? And then I would ask them also is if something happened to you, say you had a, you broke your arm or your foot, would you just let the Lord heal you? 
Right. <laughs> like, or are you going to take the medication and are you going to go to the doctor? Yeah. They probably would say, I would take the medic. They would look at me like I'm crazy. Like, I'll take the medication and go to. It's the same thing with our mental health. Yeah. Right? That doesn't mean we lack faith. Yeah. In, in fact, Dr. Anita Phillips says that in order to be more spiritually powerful, we need to be emotionally whole. Yeah. Right? So when we are whole emotionally, we go back to the beginning of this conversation. We talk about heal people, heal people. Yeah. Right? We're able now to do so much more in the kingdom. Yeah. Right? So... Of course, I'm probably biased. I don't see um, going to a counselor as lacking faith. I see it actually as more faith, if you ask me, because you're able to say, okay, God, give me the grace to heal because I'll, I'll be the first to say healing is hard. Yeah. It is hard when you got to put that thing back in and, and especially when things have been out of alignment for so long and then you got to put it back into alignment. Yeah. It hurts. Yeah. Right, so now it's depending on God that even when those things begin to come back to your memory, I remember for myself, four o'clock in the morning, I woke up, and this is me being transparent, and I started just, I started just crying. I was just bawling my eyes out, and my husband was holding me, and he's like, "Babe, what's wrong?" And I said, "I am tired. I am tired. Why are things that happened to me twenty-five years ago?" still bothering me today mm. i am tired there was such a weight and I, I was sobbing and i was tired that takes great faith to say i am there is something that has been bothering me for 12 long years yeah. like the woman of, like the the, yeah. the the woman with the issue of blood but i have faith that when I come in contact with Jesus in this specific context, yeah. that there is a healing that is going to take place. Yeah. Right? So when we have faith to go to the altar, when we have faith where we go to the doctor and, and when the doctor gives us a cancer diagnosis or something like that, we the, the faith that we have that God will heal the diagnosis in our soul, that deep wounded trauma yeah. is real to know that he will give me beauty for ashes yeah. and the oil of joy for mourning. Yeah. That is, he will turn my mourning into dancing. Yeah. When you reflect on all that you've gone through and all of the different things that you've been able, that you've experienced, the word says that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. That's amazing. Yeah. But there's something deep down inside that the Lord wants to get to, yeah. right? The last thing I'll say around this is I look at the scripture of, I think it's Luke chapter 4, where it talks about the parable of the seed and the sower, right? And I contextualize that um, within a, in, in a different way because I'm a therapist. So I see the Bible in, in different lens sometimes, right? So it talks about the fact that some fell on stony ground, some fell among thorns, um, sung fell among the wayside. That shows us the condition of our soul. Mm. So when we go to church or different things like that, and we hear the word or we hear different things, and the word doesn't land in a specific way, for example, it falls among thorns, sometimes our trauma is choking up the very word mm. that God is trying to deposit into our spirits. Wow. So I think it takes great faith and to realize that it is the will of the Father that I am well. His, he doesn't desire that I live broken. Yeah. Wow, that's so good. Everybody, I, I, we really could have this conversation for a whole nother hour. <laughs> um, Jess and I have been known in previous podcasts or interviews to go on for several hours <laughs> around conversations because there's just so much so much that we could give and mm -hmm. share mm -hmm. um, particularly around this conversation of healing um jess i i'm gonna ask you to uh pray over those that are that are watching now mm -hmm. and pray toward their healing mm -hmm. before you do one of your hallmarks one of your primary points of emphasis mm -hmm. when it comes to your ministry as a christian therapist mm -hmm. is alignment We've mm -hmm. had 
hours long of discussion mm -hmm. around alignment. Mm -hmm. Would you just kind of talk us through mm -hmm. very quickly mm -hmm. what that alignment is, mm -hmm. um, what we can do, what we can do with that, mm -hmm. and then just pray over us mm -hmm. and pray for those that are watching mm -hmm. that they would experience and have the courage mm -hmm. to experience the healing of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it really starts with being honest with ourselves that things are out of whack. <laughs> Um, that things are not working together, that I'm dressing up, I'm coming to church, I'm leading ministry, um, I'm doing all these things, I'm showing up on social media, but on the outside, I'm, I'm good, but on the inside, I'm not well, mm -hmm. right? On the inside, I'm crying. On the inside, I'm crying out for help. Um, and I've been wearing a mask this entire time. Right. So I think it's important for us to be real with ourselves. I remember one time the Lord telling me, I can't bless who you pretend to be. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we are like that lizard. Is it called a chameleon? Mm -hmm. The one that changes to the, the, the color of the room. Yeah. A lot of us change to the color of the room. And that's a defense mechanism in itself because of the trauma we've experienced. We've had to do that. Yeah. Right. Um, but my advice and my heart is that you become real with yourself and realize that this thing is affecting me. And here's the wonderful thing. You know how we think that in order to be more of him, we have to be less of us. Okay, I have a new take on that. I really do. I believe God gave me a new take on that. Because in order to be more of him, you have to be more of the real you. It's not less of me. It's not less of me. It's more of the me that he had in mind before he formed me in my mother's womb. It's that girl I'm becoming. I'm not becoming less of Pam. I'm becoming more of the original thought of God. That's who she really is. the answers all the time <laughs> that, that's like almost cussing at somebody you don't have to have all the answers all the time some of us struggle with not having the details and we're disgusted with ambiguity some of us like like me I give you an example me um, I love having details I'm a detail oriented type of person but there are some days where I have to tell God, I trust you more than I trust the details. And if that means for these moments, I have to live in a state of ambiguity, as long as you are in control, I'm okay with that.